you know, reflect on what a cool thing ScanCore is. Um, this is our third one of these. The first one 10 years ago was called Samples of the Future. Um, I, uh, 20 years ago, yes, I'll get my math right. Uh, 1998, it was um, uh, uh, Jim, Christian Kreiner, uh, Niels, you're sitting together. Uh, I came to that one, and to my surprise, these folks said, why don't you come to Stanford? Uh, so that was a very important uh, uh, event in my life. <laughs> 2008, we had another one, uh, now 2018, 30 years. That's pretty extraordinary. And uh, it's amazing that this community is, uh, has persisted and had such a big effect on, on the world of organization. So when we have a toast upstairs, we should toast many of our wonderful members who are not with us, but we should toast ourselves because I think uh, it's a remarkable group that, uh, that we've built over the years. All right, I'm going to... Um, talk about how organizations research has been influenced by uh, uh, by social movement scholarship and I'm going to try it in two ways I'll I'll spend a bit like trying to be conceptual theoretical about how I think about that should be done and then I'm going to talk about some work on transparency I'm not doing this in, in honor of the Finns who are here people from Finland will know that on Thursday at 8 a.m. they release the salaries um, of every Finnish citizen um, uh, that is what I would call radical transparency. Half the news media in the country are waiting to, uh, to get at that information. Uh, but I'm going to talk about work that we're doing on transparency and how trends towards transparency have entered civil society organizations. All right, so I'll try to do, I just said that, I want to talk about the crosstalk between these two areas. Um, and I'm going to use it in the context of work on accountability and, uh, and transparency. Um, so I think for orgs people, you know, folks who used to do what uh, Neil described, formal, bounded kinds of things, one of the challenges for us is how do ideas get inside organizations, okay? And Dick and John and Paul DiMaggio and myself, we had an account that they get in through professionals. You've heard people say that today. They get in through regulations. They get in through the mass media. But we didn't think so much that they came from rabble rousers and they didn't come from the streets. But over the years, we've sort of noticed this general tendency of what we call from Birkenstocks to, uh, to suits, in which movement activists have had a big influence on organizations. So theoretically, what we want to try to understand is how do ideas in the wider environment enter into organizations. And then my little pushback to movement scholars is when does all this chatter, when does all this talk, when does all this organization have impact? How does contention change the policies of organization? And I think the question you know, that at least I want to wrestle with is what I call the puzzle of receptivity. And I don't think we have a very good set of theories yet about receptivity. And what I mean here is how do ideas emerge? And so the emergence theme is really important. How are they attracted? And how are they repelled? Okay. And so when ideas come together, what is the process by which that happens? And I think we generally have, whoops, excuse me, uh, this thing's hyper, um, largely three different models, and I'm going to suggest a fourth, okay? So the first, um, you know, really well exemplified by Huggy Rao's work, is the idea of displacement. An old set of ideas come in, and they, uh, excuse me, sorry, Huggy, um, a new set of ideas come in, and they displace the old. You know, Nouvelle cuisine displacing um, classical cooking, and then subsequently modernist cooking supplanting uh, Nouvelle. Um, Displacement is one model. A second model, more used in political science, is kind of layering. Kathy Thielen's work, I think, is really good here, where one set of ideas come in and they're grafted upon another. You see this with amendments, various kinds of bureaucratic regulations by which this process happens. Um, a more recent one that gets talked about a lot uh, is blending. Um, Go down uh, University Avenue, walk into a breakfast uh, place and ask for a smoothie, and you'll get apple juice and kale mixed together. 
Um, and so something that was a little, you know, brownish and something green and, the prod and some yogurt, none of them are recognizable anymore. And so the blending process is in which the practices become amalgamated, but you can't see where they came from, all right? And the idea that um, I've been playing with, with uh, Aaron Horvath and Christoph Brantner, two sociology grad students of mine, is this idea of intercalation. We swipe it from uh, Peter Gallison, a historian of science, in which you try to think about how processes influence one another, maybe even have dramatic effects on one another, but they continue to persist independently. And so he does this work in the field of physics, how experimental and theoretical physics have separate journals, they live independently, but they have dramatic influences on one another. I'm going to talk about how something we institutionalists used to talk about, professionalism, managerialism, strategic management, interacts with transparency and accountability. And strategic management is actually a magnet for accountability. And management gets transformed in the process, but so does accountability, and yet they exist in their separate worlds. So that's the general idea. We like drawing pictures, you know, just to give a sense of how this process might work. These are the you know, diagrams we spend a lot of time playing with our little cartoon theories. Um, and uh, yeah, theory through colors and drawings. So um, what I want to talk now conceptually, uh, I'm going to move from that to an empirical case. And I think what, you know, the idea is how do we understand multi-level change, all right? So there's a broad movement in the wider environment that we move towards some degree of accountability. Open government that comes with new public management, um, modest moves towards corporate transparency. You can pretty much find out anybody's salary these days and um, in the US context because that data is increasingly available. Um, a general view, you know, this is from Justice Brandeis, sunlight is the best disinfectant. Um, I prefer my favorite uh, artist, Leonard Cohen, that you know, cracks are how the sunlight gets in. But this general sense that we can see more about what's going on in the world. And civil society organizations, Glass Pockets, Transparency International, they're the ones that are leading this charge. But there's a whole set of organizations who now talk at aspiration levels that we're going to shoot for openness. And I'll talk about this in a minute. And then you have to think about what's the difference between checkbox check openness. We have a whistleblower salary. We did this. We, you know, our boards of directors' salaries are available. Our staff salaries are available. And real openness, that is how you make decisions, is made publicly available. Um, and so that's part of what we're trying to study. All right. Oops. Slides out of order. <laughs> Just real quickly, a sense of... You know, what's causing this process? There are a whole set of things going on. You know, um, one of my favorite books is a book by Mike Shudson called The Right to Know. He shows how all the way back to the 1960s, product labeling, consumer safety, a whole set of things have been underway to tell us more about what we eat and what we use. Of course, Michael Power was influential to a lot of us, his work on the Audit Society. You could be a Foucaultian about this. We are being observed and we are observing. That's certainly the case in terms of what's going on in our world. New public management was certainly a force. Um, my favorite organizational ethnography in recent years is by Catherine Turco, the conversational firm, and she has this fantastic line. Customers now direct a whole set of conversations that corporations once controlled. And she talks through that. And then she also argues, quite interestingly, that the interactional order of organizations has changed. A vocal cult culture is now commonplace. And there's a fabulous quote in there from her study of TechCo, a, a Kindle Square a tech startup. Ideally, I want the decision to come from the top down, but with input having been encouraged and elicited from throughout the chain. And that certainly sounds like a millennial raised by a helicopter parent. Um, and you know, that's the kind of interactional order you see increasingly in organizations. So we've been studying for 15 years um, a sample, a random sample of 200 
Bay Area nonprofit organizations, following them each year, have their salary data, their tax data. We've interviewed them three times. We're now launching this uh, study comparatively just this past week in Shenzhen, China is our comparison. We're also doing it in Vienna, Austria, and Sydney, and Seattle, and lots of places. But I'm just going to talk about the Bay Area. So these are organizations in the 10-county region. This is the fifth largest metropolitan region in the U.S. There are all kinds. There are schools, there are arts, there are environmental organizations. Um, and what is so clear to us as we do this study is that these organizations are expressions of social movements, okay? That they are the formal tip of the iceberg of a whole lot of stuff going on underneath. Um, and, you know, We've sent papers in over the years, ASQ, wherever, ASR, AJS, revisory submit, that's all you hear. Um, and part of what we get pushed back on is, uh, well, this is unique to the Bay Area. This is a California phenomenon. This is a San Francisco phenomenon. So that's one reason we're doing the comparative part. You know, so that's, that's important. But damn it, it is a California phenomenon. And that's what we try to make the case. And so if you see our organizations, the environmental organizations all harken back to this man, John Muir, who was a founder of the environmental movement in the 19th century. You know, the political organizations, this is the free speech movement at Berkeley in 1965, although a dramatic difference in dress among the protesters back then. Look at that, uh, uh, the ties. Um, uh, a really important one is something that actually longtime residents of this area will know is the Save the Bay movement. The Save the Bay actually created the Bay Area because it required collective action on the part of dozens, hundreds of small cities and large cities to actually work collectively to make this place, you know, where you could actually sail and swim and fish uh, uh, in the bay. It used to be a very toxic bay. Um, and then, of course, more recently, um, uh, the equal rights uh, for all to, uh, to marry. These are local phenomena that get instantiated in local organizations, but then spread, and they move around the world, okay? Um, so you might say, well, what's the big deal? Well, here is a good example of the transformation we want to, uh, uh, to get a hold of. Um, in 2005, Abilities um, United organization uh, was busy trying to think about how do we provide coverage service throughout the lifespan for its for its members, and so they were engaging in mergers and acquisitions as a nonprofit, so they would have all stages of life, and they would have geographic coverage. That same organization today, the leader says, "I do more speaking, blah blah blah." We come to people and say, "Hey." This isn't about charity. This isn't about business sense. This isn't. This is about hiring diversity. This is about human rights. It's about your bottom line. It's what side of history are you going to be on? You know, there's the transformation. Before we want to be well ma managed, look like good MBAs. Now it's wait a minute. What side of history are you on? Um, and we see that across a really large number of our organizations, in which they shift from an inward orientation, you know, we have cost centers, 15 of these don't make a financial contribution. How do we deal with that? To, this is one of my favorite, 2015, woman goes off to an executive education program. So there is managerialism, all right? She goes to Harvard Kennedy School to take a exec program. She comes back and we ask her, what did you learn? She comes back and Eero will love it because she says, I learned storytelling. The best course I had was Marshall Gans, okay? And what I've decided to do is screw this, quantify everything. I'm going to go out there and do friend raising. I'm going to mobilize in the community to find people who support our organization, and I'm going to reward staff for the more friends they bring in, all right? So that's the intercalation. She was off studying to be a better executive, but what is doing that cause her to do, she brings back movement mobilization kinds of skills. All right, all right, I better go faster because I'm running out of time. I think the big question for us is, 
is this a new organizational requirement or does this reflect possibly a more democratic form of work? And that's the main kind of question we're having. And we're trying to think hard about what are ways of theorizing and coming up with dimensions of openness? Do we want to we distinguish between procedural, the kind of checkbox, to, uh, represent, to presentational? We think a lot about open communication, voice, but closed decision making. People say to us, opinions can be heard, but that doesn't mean they're made by popular vote. That's important. There are organizations that are open externally, closed internally. The organizations closed externally, open internally. And so how different is this new world from the older world of uh, uh, informal organization and on what dimension? Um, so is openness a facade or a new model? It's easy to be skeptical. Reviewers are freaking skeptical folks. I guess that's what sociologists are meant to be. They say, oh, focus groups, blogs, that's just PR, okay? Um, but some forms of transparency are really transformative. The most interesting one I know is on the tax form 990, where organizations now tout their outcome and their impact. There is no requirement whatsoever to do that. You know, I'm an officer of the Social Science Research Council. I've been in that job for 20 years. We spend all kinds of time now in our 90 saying, here's how we're changing the world. And our accountants say, that's great, you should do that, but there's no legal requirement to do that, okay? We are opining about what we're doing. So I don't want to be cynical. Some of these organizations, they're moving from outcome transparency, telling the world what they're doing, to a kind of process transparency. They're asking constituents how they should be doing things. They're talking about things they've done wrong. They're admitting failures in advance. They're saying, of course, we're going to be rated and ranked, but let's not be like these universities that are so obsessed and worried about ratings and rankings. Let's get out there ahead of them and rank ourselves. Um, and having blogs on their web pages in which the public can talk about them. Rather than letting Yelp opine about them, let's create our own internal Yelp. Now, why is that? I think part of the issue is that some of the organizations were founded by people who were once clients. Some are run by people who are children or daughters uh, of elderly parents or young children who need the services. And so uh, openness is actually near and dear to the identity of the staff. And to me, that's an example, and I'll stop here, of how movements have gotten inside organizations and in the process are beginning to transform our sense of how formal organizations actually operate. Thank you. Mm -hmm.